Well, welcome everyone to our October event, A Delicious Nutritious Adventure in collaboration with Plant-Based Nutrition Movement. My name is Carrie Bruno. I'm a pharmacist, a PBNM board member, and your host for tonight's event. Plant-Based Nutrition Movement is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to educate, inspire, and support those moving towards an evidence-based, whole, minimally processed, plant-based way of eating uh, to improve health and quality of life at all ages. This event is open to everyone interested in health and wellness. Whether you've never heard about plant-based eating, you're curious about trying it, or you've already been following this way of eating for many years, we're all here to learn and help one another. We can always learn and share with each other information that is helpful and practical to make it easier to start and maintain a plant-based journey. So with that in mind, we recently decided to change up these events a little bit and focus on seasonal ingredients and practical tips, as well as inviting guest speakers to share their experiences and healing stories with us. There are many definitions of an adventure. To most people, adventure means doing something new, unusual, exciting, or taking a trip. And if you've ever had the opportunity to travel outside of the country or even to other parts of the United States, a big part of, advent of adventure is exploring the area and trying new cuisines. So we'll be traveling the world and looking to different cultures to learn what similarities and differences make them unique. Each culture uses combinations of herbs, spices, and other ingredients to make, their, to make their food delicious and nutritious. And we hope that you'll take this adventure with us, whatever your meaning and purpose is for being here. This specific event is held monthly and has typically up until now been on the fourth Tuesday of the month. However, going forward, we're moving the event to the third Tuesday of the month and the only exception to this will be next month's event, November. We are gonna continue it on the fourth Tuesday to avoid the week of Thanksgiving. Um, this program will be recorded and available for future viewing or sharing on the PBNM YouTube channel. And these events are free to attend and we welcome donations to pbnm.org to cover our production costs. If you'd like more information about this group, PBNM, and future events, go to pbnm.org. Be sure to explore our Six Million Seeds project, which is focused on child nutrition, and our resources tab listing recommended books, documentaries, YouTube channels, and trusted websites. And with all of that, let me tell you what's in store for you tonight. We have two speakers with us tonight. Our first speaker is Janet Pearson. She is also a PBNM board member and a one-on-one -on -one plant based coach. She'll be starting us off for 10 to 15 minutes with our seasonal segment. She'll be sharing her favorite but unique fall recipes and tips for adding warming fall spices to both food and drinks. And then our featured guest speaker for tonight is Sid Nodder sharing her presentation titled, Staying Motivated with Whole Food Plant-Based Eating Through the Holidays. After Sid's presentation, we'll leave 10 to 15, or 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, everyone ex except the speakers will be muted, and we ask that everyone remain muted to avoid interruptions and background noise. Uh, please use the chat box for questions. So without further ado, let's get this event started. Janet, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you. Welcome, everyone. And I thought pumpkins and pumpkin spice puree and seeds would be a great topic this time of year because everywhere we go, we are looking at pumpkins, whether they're decorations, food, uh, any kind of spices, they're everywhere they're on the street and in decorations on everybody's doorstep. So I was always interested in pumpkins and uh, I'm I, like everyone else, used to carve them as a young person, and my mom or dad would get the biggest one we could find. We would carve it, we would scoop out uh, the insides, and we'd roast the seeds, and they, those would be snacks, of course, and uh, then we would, you know, throw, throw the pumpkin away, but now I've learned you could compost the pumpkin, so don't throw it away, and if you leave it too long outside, 
the squirrels or the animals will probably have a feast because it's almost like a treat to them. But this year I decided to try one of these little tiny ones. And what I've learned is the larger pumpkins are great for carving, but the smaller pumpkins are what you want for eating, for making, they're called pie pumpkins. And this one happens to be an organic one that I recently, just a few days ago, got from Whole Foods. And I was watching a video because this is a first experience for me and basically learn how to cut it and you have to peel it and then cut it in slices this way. And then I'll take the seeds out. You could roast them. All parts of the pumpkin are edible. Even the jack-o'-lanterns, the large ones, they're edible, but the smaller ones have a firmer texture and a finer texture. And then when I was Saturday at the farmer's market, my local farmer's market, I found these cute little butternut squash. So I bought two of them and the farmer said that they're sweeter than the butternut squash, the big ones, but they, they're perfect for an individual serving. So I decided to get a few of those. And then for anybody who hasn't ever tried a butternut squash this is what it, it looks like and when you're looking at they're all over I walked it in the Trader Joe's and all the squashes hit me and they're right pretty much at every grocery store but when you're shopping for a butternut squash you want to and all the squashes they want to feel heavy almost like a watermelon when you pick them up not all dried and you don't want to get a marred one and the butternut squash, the big, this part, the longest, thickest part is the one that you want to choose because this is all solid when you cut it. It's all flesh. And then there's seeds in this round part. So just a little tip when you're buying butternut squash. And they're very, they're very hard to cut into. So what I found, I found a tip that if you put it in the microwave or steam it, for just a little bit, it softens it enough to cut it so you're not fighting with your knife and, um, you know, being in a dangerous situation. So I would recommend heating it a little bit, softening it, just piercing it, and then trying to, and then cooking different recipes with it. Now, the nice thing about pumpkin is not only are they around everywhere this time of year, they can be used in savory and sweet dishes. And also they last for several months. That's why they're called winter squashes. And it's really nice to have fresh uh, vegetables. Actually, it's considered a fruit uh, because they have seeds inside. And as I said, you could either roast the seeds, use the flesh, roast it, or you could buy if you want an easier way, you can buy the, I have the puree, pumpkin puree by itself. And could you see that? When you're looking for pumpkin puree, you want to be sure that the ingredients just have pumpkins and not the pumpkin pie spice, because that would have added sugar and spices probably in it for a pumpkin pie. Uh, let's see, the next thing I wanted to show you is the pumpkin seeds. If you don't want to go through the trouble and roast, I highly recommend roasting the seeds, but you could find pumpkin seeds in a bag. Uh, these I, I get from Trader Joe's, and I love to put them on my salads and uh, a little on soups and granola bars or cookies. It's a great little snack are just to munch on because they're actually low in calorie and very high in protein and nutrients. So I, I highly recommend the pumpkin seeds. And who knew we could eat every part of the pumpkin? Now, I'm gonna tell you a little about, in my research, I found that pumpkins and all of the squashes can be used interchangeably in a recipe. So if you have a recipe that says pumpkin, but you don't have a pumpkin or you're out of canned pumpkin, you can use a butternut squash or even a sweet potato. It might change the texture and the flavor of touch, but it'll be very similar and they're all interchangeable. So that's an interesting um, an interesting way to you know incorporate a new food into your diet. And 
have you ever wondered why pumpkin spice blend is, you know, the spice and the flavoring, when you look on the back of the pumpkin spice blend, it doesn't even list pumpkin in it. How did it get its name? It basically got its name because it's a spice combination of usually cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, sometimes ginger, sometimes allspice, sometimes lemon, and sometimes even black pepper I've seen in some of them. And cardamom is also another spice. So any of those combinations were used for pumpkin pie. And that's kind of evolved the name of the pumpkin pie spice. And those can be found all individually or they could be found in blends, but be sure to read the back also, because some blends, even when you're looking for cinnamon, it might be added sugar or salt or some ingredients that you may not want in your spices. And I, I brought some spices actually out to show everybody. And cinnamon, the real cinnamon, it comes like this. And it's like, it comes from the inside bark of a tree. It's sort of an evergreen tree. And there's three types of cinnamon, and they're all delicious. There's a common one, there's a cassia, it's called, a Ceylon, and then a Saigon or a, Vi a Vietnamese uh, cinnamon. So all of them are good. They're different price ranges, but if you see the Saigon or the Vietnamese, I, I've um, found that once at... Um, well, I think it was um, TJ Maxx, you know, those specialty aisles that I always look for bargains. And it's, I find it's really more flavorful than the regular ordinary cinnamon. And then there are a few um, variations of that. One would be called apple spice. And basically it's adding vanilla powder or vanilla extract. I prefer the powder, which is the actual whole vanilla bean to my recipes now. And a little bit goes a long way. You use about half of the amount that your recipe would call for with the extract, but this is pure vanilla uh, powder and it doesn't have any alcohol in it. So it's real tasty. Another uh, spice that you may or may not be aware of is anise. Anise is used in both Italian and Mexican seasonings and the anise seed can be purchased in, and could you see that? Um, little little um, special seeds can be put in breads and uh, different uh, bakery. And then this is called the star anise and it has a little star in it and for the name, and it, it's very similar. They have a touch of a licorice uh, hint to them, and they're used in um, drinks and teas and coffees and hot chocolates, and as I said, different bakery items. So those are the, those are the primary spices, and I did want to try or show you how nutmeg comes. You could buy nut, nutmeg in a powder, or you could buy it in the whole nut. It almost looks like an acorn. And what you do is you just take take one out and you, you know, kind of grate it. And a little bit goes a long way with the, um, the clove and the nutmeg, whereas the cinnamon is more, um, more potent and you can actually use more cinnamon in a recipe than all of the other ones. Just a pinch or sometimes only an eighth of a uh, teaspoon is recommended. So you have to be careful with those. And this month, I just wanted to encourage everyone to look on your sh uh, shelves, grocery shelves, or Sam's Club even carries the Forks Over Knives magazine. It comes out four times a year. And I try to pick one up because it's the only magazine I like that has all the recipes that are oil free and they have beautiful pictures and they have stories and no advertisements. So I like to read the, the different uh, combinations and it gives me very creative ideas to try uh, new recipes. And before is my last little close, I know I'm at, um, almost up with time, but at my farmer's market, I wanted to share a tea that um, the olive oil Greek 
uh, vendor. He's actually has a farm in Greece, and he said he he encouraged me to try this mountain tea. It's called Greek Mountain Tea. You could research it. It's it's very um, medicinal if you have a sore throat or a cold, and it tastes really good. And you can buy it online. But this was this whole container was only four dollars at the farmers market. So I want to encourage everyone to try some new things this year and, um, you know, experiment. A lot of the recipes that I had found online, since we're limited to time here, and it's not really a cooking demo, we're going to put in the recorded version on YouTube. All of the links, I have over 100 recipes and combinations of different nutritional values and information and tips on how to use pumpkin, pumpkin spice, and pumpkin seeds. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Carrie to introduce uh, Sid, our guest speaker. Well, thank you so much, Janet. I am definitely inspired to go incorporate some new spices and different squash into my into my recipes in the next coming coming weeks. Um, moving right along, I'm going to introduce our next guest speaker. Sid Nodder is a Center for Nutrition Studies certified professional, a PCRM Food for Life instructor, a certified starch solution instructor, and a former certified health educator for Wellness Forum Health. She's also a past newspaper columnist and the author of the award-winning book, The Plan A Diet, combining whole food plant-based nutrition with the timeless wisdom of scripture. Sid hosts an inflammation support group each month for pbnsg.org and is often a featured speaker at VegFests and other groups. She offers personal coaching services and has provided a variety of health and cooking classes for over 25 years. Sid has also worked with school district employees and a hospital's fitness center. Welcome, Sid. We're happy Thank to have you. you as our guest tonight. Thank you so much. And how did I not know that pumpkin was a fruit? <laughs> I did not know that. Thank you, uh, Janet, for sharing that. <laughs> Well, I have a slideshow. Shall I pull that up and get started? Because we are going to be talking about something really important today, which is how to stay motivated with plant-based eating through the holidays. Not an easy task. All right, let's see. How's that? Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, so the holidays can be the most challenging time of the year. Let's get to my first screen here. There we go. Because not only are our stress levels really high, but we've got long to-do lists, we've got deadlines, and we're surrounded by high-fat, high-sugar foods, which are in abundance and sometimes right in our face, right? If you're at work or um, if you're at somebody's house, there's usually a lot of food going on at this time of year. So it creates the perfect storm because it's stressful and we're surrounded by food. So we've got family parties, office get-togethers, potlucks. Uh, bakery exchanges, uh, caramel corn in the mall, plates of cookies, tubs of chocolates. And if your family is not eating plant-based, you you know could still find yourself surrounded by cheese trays and lots of alcohol and buckets of chicken or whatever they happen to be bringing in for the parties. So it can be really challenging to stay the course, even when we have the best intentions to do so. So we've got to be very careful that we don't give ourselves unspoken permission to start eating less than optimal foods, you know, big amounts of, of unhealthy foods. Uh, sometimes we can justify it. It's the holidays after all, right? We could tell ourselves that, or we might feel like we're somehow being deprived when we see all these other foods around us. So how do we stay motivated to stick with our healthy plans? Well, the biggest key to success lies directly between our ears, right? That's, it's been said that eating a healthy diet is 80% mentality and 20% skill. And I, I think I agree with that pretty much. It's all in the mentality and a little bit of skill, of course, once you learn how to shop and cook differently. So today I'll share four tips on how to stay mentally motivated. And I hope you'll get at least one or two good takeaways here that will resonate with you today. 
So first of all, let me share this with you. Have you ever heard the tale of the two wolves? The first time I heard it, it just really resonated with me. I heard it years ago and I've just never forgotten it. And there are several variations of this story online, but it's a Cherokee legend that illustrates the importance of our thoughts and choices. And how it goes is that a Cherokee grandfather is teaching his grandson about life. And he says, every day there's a fight going on inside of me. And it's a terrible fight between two wolves. One wolf is evil. He's the bad wolf. He's anger and envy and sorrow, regret, greed, resentment, um, false pride and ego. And he said, but the other wolf is a good wolf. He's joy, peace, love, hope. Uh, serenity, humility, compassion, and, and faith. And he tells his grandson that the same fight is going on inside of you too, and inside every other person. And so the grandson thought about it for a minute, and he asked his grandfather, well, which wolf will win? And the grandfather replies, the one that you feed. So this whole story is about mindset. Mindset is the key theme here. And it's a powerful illustration of the importance of the power of our thoughts and how both wolves are fed by our daily uh, choices and thoughts, right? So when we decide to feed the good wolf every day, uh, we will ultimately have success because what we choose to dwell upon is definitely going to influence our behaviors, our habits, and our subsequent actions. So the more we feed the good wolf, the less food supply there's going to be for that evil wolf. So that evil wolf is going to try to tell you that there's no way you can stick with a healthy diet this season. He's going to try to discourage you and bring up any past failures that you may have had or try to get you to believe lies about yourself or he'll lower your self-esteem. And while we can't always ignore those negative thoughts and emotions, we can recognize them for what they are and stop giving them all of our attention. Because when we stop fixating on the thoughts that don't serve us well, the evil wolf will lose his strength and power over us. Now, feeding the good wolf is also a conscious decision, and that doesn't just happen. But the good wolf reminds you of your strengths and that you're an intelligent, confident person who does have the ability to continue down the right path toward your goals this season, in spite of any obstacles that might come along. The good wolf reminds you of your accomplishments and shows you how far you've already come and he encourages you to continue to grow. And the truth is that sometimes it's much easier to feed the evil wolf than the good one, right? Because the evil wolf offers the more simple way out because he encourages us to just put things off, just give up, just stay defeated. But that's not what we wanna do. Feeding the good wolf takes more effort and determination and courage too. But remember that the more you feed the good wolf, the stronger he grows and the more he empowers you. So today I'm gonna to share four tips on how to feed the good wolf in order to stay motivated through the holidays, especially when you're faced with all these tempting foods that are surrounding us. So the first thing to think about are your big whys, which are your motivators for eating this way. Um, we all have deep motivations, which are crucial to our success because the motivations are what drive you to make things happen. So what, may, what motivated you initially to begin eating a plant-based diet? Now, all of us had initial reasons, right? Maybe it was concern for the animals or weight loss or health improvement or the environment. And perhaps those reasons have morphed or grown to include other reasons too over time. So when you consider your big whys, like why you started eating this way, add the words so that. That's really going to make a difference in the way you think because your why is the desire, but adding the words so that will be the real motivator. And let me give you just a few examples here. So these are things I've heard from some of my clients. I want to get rid of my joint pain so that I can comfortably travel and play with my grandkids. So the desire is to get rid of joint pain, but the so that is really the bigger motivator, right? Why do you want to do that? So you can travel, right, and play with your grandkids. Here's another client that said, I just turned 50. I'm overweight and I have hypertension and I don't like where this is heading. So I need to make some changes so that 
I can age well and avoid having a heart attack. Okay, so this client was concerned with heart disease in her family. Another client says, my gut issues prevent me from doing so many things, and I want to reverse this so that I can stop being afraid of going out and worrying if I'll find a bathroom, right? That's a big motivator. If every time you go out, you're, you know, your stomach gets upset. So that's why they want to get their gut issues back in order. This client said, I watched my dad suffer with dementia and I want to eat right so that my family doesn't go through that same heartache with me. Now that's a big motivator right there. Another person said, I'm concerned about my immune system because I'm sick a lot and I want to strengthen my immunity. Why? Well, so that I can better ward off colds and any viruses that are going to come down the pike, right? We don't know what's coming down the pike as far as viruses go. And we want to have a strong immune system. So my own personal um, story is why I eat this way. It started years ago. I have a dire family history filled with heart disease, cancer, strokes, diabetes, inflammatory problems. I mean, you name it. <laughs> my family has had it. And I want to stay out of the medical system. That is my personal goal for as much as possible so that I can continue to hike. And as I get older, this is more important. I want to stay independent as I get older and make my own decisions. So for me, that's a big, a big, big reason why I continue to eat this way. So when we have a big enough why, it will allow us to endure anyhow. That's the, the saying that I like to encourage people with. So the second tip is um, examine your limiting beliefs. So when I first learned about this, I read a book years ago called Cruise Ship or Nursing Home, and it talked about limiting beliefs. And what they are are these false assumptions that we have about ourselves or false assumptions about how the world works. They can be those little voices that restrict the way we live, and really they can block us from reaching our full potential. So they start out of, as these little thoughts that we tell ourselves over and over again until we finally internalize them as truths to be believed. And we all have limiting beliefs. I mean, we all do. I sure do too. And the evil wolf loves to add fuel to the fire when it comes to our limiting beliefs. So if you have ever sabotaged your own success, maybe in some way, or, you know, done something to get yourself off track, chances are high that maybe you have formed a limiting belief too. So here's just a few examples of limiting beliefs that I've heard. Um, it, it's not in the cards for me to eat healthy or to ever be thin. I never stick to anything. I can't afford to, to eat healthy. Healthy food tastes horrible. I've tried everything. Diet and lifestyle won't matter in my case. It's way too hard. It's too expensive. I can't give up my sweets. This is just who I am. I don't have energy or time to exercise. I'm too old, um, and this is called the blah, blah, which, you know, it just goes on. So limiting beliefs really lead us to start making excuses sometimes. So if any of these resonate with you, you may have formed a limiting belief in your mind that stops you from making progress, right? It, I, I have them myself. I have to be very aware of them. So they could also stop us from sticking to our plan this holiday season. So the trick is to catch those negative thought patterns and replace them with more realistic statements that will lead to positive actions. In other words, stop feeding that evil wolf and start empowering the good wolf. And one, one way to do that is to get a piece of paper, you know, draw a line down the middle, make two columns, write all of your limiting beliefs on the left-hand side. Now, this is gonna take some time to really think about it and do some soul searching. Um, it could be you, maybe you think you're too old to lose weight or that you don't really have time to cook or that your parents were sick and overweight, so you will be too. That's just the cards that you've been dealt. Then once you realize what some of the things you might be believing are that are maybe false, you cross those out and you replace it with a, a true yet realistic statement. It's got to be a, something realistic. So you would cross out, I'm too old to lose weight and you would change it to, I am capable of losing weight safely at any age. As you would cross out, um, I don't have time to cook, 
and change it to, I can prepare simple meals and my health is worth it. And you would cross out, my parents were sick and overweight and change that to, my choices determine my health outcomes because genetics play only a small role. So uh, there's a whole worksheet for this assignment on my website. If you go to sidnodder.com and just type limiting beliefs in the search bar, you'll find an assignment on this and maybe it would be helpful. So again, you'll have to do some soul searching because we're not always aware of these little voices that we've in started to internalize. But once you uh, complete this assignment, then you can start feeding the good wolf. Keep your answers where you can read them, keep them handy until they, you start to internalize um, you know, the good parts. So that was the second tip about limiting beliefs. The third tip to stay motivated is to practice gratitude. And this ties in very closely with what we just talked about limiting beliefs. Because we're, when we're engaging in that negative self-talk, that's gonna prevent us from achieving our goals. So we need to reject those messages, as I've just explained, and replace them with um, po the positive aspects of our life. So one way to do that is to write down all of the things that we can be grateful for. Write them down or journal um, everything you're grateful for, your family, the roof over your head, the availability of healthy food, that, and that you have a warm house right now, the fact that you have a car and you can drive to the store or the fact that you're capable of learning how to shop and cook differently, uh, your comfy bed, your pets, your faith, your friends, there's so many things to be grateful for, plus any health benefits that you've already seen or any weight loss that you've already achieved. Because uh, gratitude will help us stay motivated when we're grateful for what we're gaining instead of focusing on what we're giving up. Right, So when we're grateful for what we've already achieved and what we've already got, there's going to be less time to be thinking about the things that we're giving up. We're, we can't be focusing on what we're giving up. One mental trick that I use to reframe my mind with gratitude is I use the words I get to. Because sometimes I can develop a bad attitude like over mundane household chores or you know, anytime I feel a bad attitude creeping in about having to do one more thing. I'll just change that narrative to, oh, I get to run errands today, or I get to pull weeds today. <laughs> huh? Sometimes when I realize that many people aren't even physically able to perform those routine tasks, but they would give anything to be able to do that, that just realigns my perspective and instills gratitude in my heart. And this type of thinking also um, works too when we're faced with food choices. For example, be grateful that you get to choose healthy foods that are going to nourish your body. You might think to yourself, I get to not be a helpless victim when it comes to my health. You know, I'm grateful for that. I get to learn a new way of cooking that won't contribute to heart disease. Um, I get to have mashed potatoes and gravy that's going to reverse my diabetes. So when we reframe our thinking this way, I get to eat chocolate pudding that's going to actually lessen my joint pain. And also, you're going to get to stop worrying about your family history because your genes don't automatically determine or de destine you for disease. So with each healthy meal that you eat this holiday season, you can feed the good wolf by being grateful for the benefits that food provides and, and be grateful for the things you get to do because of that. All right, last and final tip, and this is I think one of the most important is to choose your words wisely to stick with good habits. And I'm talking about internal words. Words really matter. And all through this presentation, we've been talking about our internal words. But when we are faced with tempting off-plan foods, we need to determine ahead of time what words or statements are going to boost our resistance. I call this, it's like equipping the toolbox between our ears, right? Because that's where the battle lies, is right between our ears. So these positive statements that we have to keep in our brain are the, are the tools, are the toolbox. And then we can pull these out whenever we need them, especially if we're tired or bored or stressed out. And so it's important to keep these things handy. Maybe write them down where they're at your immediate disposal. So here are some tips for internal words. Don't say the words, I'll try. I'll try to avoid the cinnamon buns at the mall, or I'll try not to overindulge on peppermint mocha lattes this year. 
determine ahead of time that you are going to av avoid that refined bakery at the mall and you are going to not have the high sugar lattes, right? But when we say the words, I'll try, it's kind of already providing an escape route that's going to weaken your mental commitment, right? So just saying, I'll try all, you know, research shows that you're already planning a little way out, maybe not even consciously. So instead, use those positive toolbox statements that were in your limiting beliefs exercise. But the thing about this is um, this, these thoughts, these positive statements that we're talking about now, they go a little deeper into your values. It's what you care about and what's important to you. Build your statements around that because everybody's going to be different with what resonates with them. So I'll share a couple of my examples here. Um, when, when I'm tempted to veer, to veer off course, there's a couple scriptures that I use. One says, anything a person gives into controls him and soon becomes his master. So I think about that. And I'm in the store looking at this processed vegan cupcake. And I'm thinking, hmm. Am I going to give in to this processed vegan cupcake and allow a cupcake to control me and allow it to master me? No, I'm stronger than a cupcake. So that is my little mental thing right there. Another verse that I like to use says, um, it says in scripture that everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. So I will not be enslaved by anything and allow it to control me. So again, I say to myself, that vegan ice cream in the freezer case is filled with questionable ingredients, but technically it's permissible for me, right? It's vegan, it's an ice cream, but is it beneficial for me? No, not really. So am I gonna allow that ice cream to control me right now? I don't need that vegan junk food. I can make this so much cheaper and healthier at home. So that's kind of my internal talk, talking to myself there. But other things, and, and again, you'll have to find what resonates with you. Here are a, a few examples. You could say to yourself, I have a clear mind and the desire to make good food decisions. Remind yourself that you are an intelligent person with a clear mind and you're in control of yourself. I trust myself to make the right decisions at the family party and I have all the abilities I need to do that. Um, there are no food challenges today that I cannot confidently handle. And so the trick is, again, that you have to determine which statements are going to resonate with you deeply enough to provide the motivation that you need when you're facing a food challenge. Here's another one that works really well for me. It's using the, word, the words, I don't versus I can't. And there are several articles online about this study that was published in the Journal of Consumer Research back in 2012, which compared the difference between internally using the words or verbally out loud and using the words I don't versus I can't. So the researchers, they took a group of people and told them when you're faced with a temptation, use the words I can't. For example, I can't eat ice cream. And they told another group of participants that when they were faced with the temptation, they would use the words I don't. For example, I don't eat ice cream. And the students were asked to repeat those phrases over and over. And then later, as each student walked out of the classroom, they were given a choice between a chocolate candy bar or a healthy granola bar. And the students who told themselves, I can't, chose this, the candy bar 61% of the time, while the students who said, I don't, only chose the candy bar 36% of the time. So based on that, the researchers decided to design a new study and they asked 30 women to sign up for a health and wellness seminar. And all the women were asked to think about a long-term health or wellness goal that was important to them. And then the women were split into three groups. So group one was told that when they felt tempted to lapse on their goal, they should just say no. I'll just say no to missing my workout today. Group two was said was told that when they felt tempted to lapse on their goals, they should use the can't strategy. I can't miss my workout today. And group three was told that when they felt tempted to lapse on their goals, they should use the don't strategy. I don't miss workouts. So for the next 10 days, each woman received an email asking her to report on her progress. And here's what they discovered after just 10 days. The group that said 
just say no. I say no to missing my workout. Three out of 10 stuck with the goals for their for the entire 10 days. The group that said, I can't, I can't miss my workout, for example, one out of 10 stuck with their goals the entire 10 days. But the group that said, I don't, I don't miss my workout, eight out of 10 of those women stuck with their goals the entire 10 days. And why is that? And the researchers say it's because the words we use internally create a feedback loop in our brain that impacts our future behaviors. So when we say I can't, it creates a feedback loop that's a reminder of our limitations, right? It, it kind of indicates that we're forcing ourselves to do something we don't want to do. Like, I can't eat that glazed donut. I would if I could, but, you know, I just can't. So that's setting yourself up, you know, for a limiting belief in a way. But when we say I don't, it creates a feedback loop that reminds us of our control and power over the situation, right? I've already determined that I don't eat glazed donuts. So simply saying I don't eat glazed, glazed donuts leaves little room for debate, right? It's a hard and fast rule that we've already determined ahead of time. And just that little mental tip right there can make all the difference in your habits. In other words, the phrase I can't is psychologically draining and it undermines your sense of power but using the phrase I don't is a more psychologically empowering way to say no. So every time you catch yourself saying I can't eat this or that, simply change the narrative and say I don't eat this or that because it's always going to be your choice. You get to decide what you're going to do and, or not do and you get to decide what you're going to eat or not eat. So this technique really works well for me personally. Um, last Christmas, I I won a bag of Dove chocolates at a Christmas event, a big bag of Dove chocolates, which I used to really like. And instead of saying, oh, no, I don't eat that, I just graciously accepted the gift, figuring I'll give it away or something. So, But I had a 30-minute ride on the way home, and that bag of Dove chocolates was sitting next to me on the passenger seat. So I had a lot of I don't eat that anymore conversations in the car right then because I thought, oh, just have one Dove chocolate. But no, I don't eat Dove chocolates anymore. Well, I lasted the car right home. And when I got home, I threw the bag in the garbage. So that's my little tip there to really tell yourself, I've already decided I don't eat that. Now, this is a recap of the four tips that I shared. Your big whys, you know, keeping your motivators in mind with the words so that. Your limiting beliefs, perhaps, that you've formed practicing gratitude, and then choosing our internal words wisely. And all four of these tips reflect the need for thought and awareness, right? This is about mindfulness because our minds are going to have to be fully engaged if we truly intend to stay on track this holiday season, especially with all the to-do lists and decorating and shopping and stress. The holidays are the time when we need even more awareness of our lifestyle habits, not less. You know, it's Lifestyle sometimes goes on the side of the road when we're busy and we don't have time, but this is the time of year when we need to be paying closer attention. So I hope at least one of these tips resonated with you. If so, I'd like to know which one in the chat did resonate with you because I know that you can stick to your plan this holiday season. And you know what? You'll be so glad you did on January 1st. You're gonna be really glad that you stuck with your plan. Just remember to always feed the good wolf because the you five years from now is going to thank the you of today by applying these tips and make, like, making wise choices. And this is my final slide in case you want to keep in touch. I would actually love that. My website is sidnotter.com and there's my email. I also have a free webinar there called Three Food Mistakes That Lead to Painful Joints, Extra Pounds, and Health Problems the Doctors Aren't Solving. And there's other free stuff there too. But I also have an inflammation in your diet class that I taught at our local college for several years. And if you use the co coupon code TAKEOFF50, you'll get 50% off of that as a little gift for today for having me on. And that is my story. <laughs> oh, are there any questions or any tips that you have? Any tips that you all use to stay motivated during the holidays? 
Well, thank you so much, Sid. Um, let's see if there's questions. Yeah, just comments now. Um, Susan said she also likes that I don't eat that tied in with gratitude. Um, yeah. I do have one question. So, um, you know, I, I'm assuming many, many people may have this problem if you've started, you know, trying to be aware and um, practice gratitude. It can be along with everything else. Maybe you kind of lose track of that or it, it's hard to keep that going. So is there a tip that you can recommend for someone to um to, I guess, remember to take time to write down what we're what we're grateful for and practice gratitude when we're busy with so many other things. Mm -hmm. Some people have a gratitude journal where they use that at the end of the day to journal what they're grateful for. Other people, the minute they wake up, I'm so grateful I'm awake. I've got a I can wear clothes and I'm going to go have some food in my warm house. I mean, right off the bat, they start mm -hmm. the narrative right off the bat. Sometimes if you're not a morning person, like I'm not, that's not the first thing that comes to mind, but it's a good practice to try to get into. Whatever's going to work for you, if to, if it's a sticky note in the car or or just to take a deep breath sometimes, you know, we get in this big hurried season and and it's stressful and everything is hurried and just to stop and take a deep breath, even if you're in line at the grocery store, just to practice gratitude there, wherever you are, just think about something there that you can be grateful for. Even in trouble, you know, we're instructed in scripture that even when you're having trials, there's always something there to be grateful for. Try to find it. Okay, I like that. Thank you. If anyone else has questions, you can feel free to add them to the chat at this time. I do have another question, and this can go, I guess, for Sid and for Janet. Um, is there a specific go-to recipe that you like to bring to family celebrations this time of year? Maybe for, for those who eat plant-based and maybe for those who don't. Something that everyone can um, can enjoy. Janet? I, sure, I could start with that. I, um, last uh, year for the holidays, I brought a Instant Pot, my largest one, filled with minestrone vegetable soup, and everybody loved it. It was hot. It was warm. Everybody had it in addition to other things they were eating. And another one of my favorites that I cooked for some company, family, that is not on a plant-based uh, diet, they don't usually eat beans or sweet potatoes and soup, was the African sweet potato uh, peanut soup. And it has a, Sid actually encouraged me to make it a few years ago, and it was shared by um, Eat Plant-Based. Uh, and I, I do have the link in the, in my, the show notes that we'll share, but it has a very unique, combination of ingredients, cumin and chili pepper and ginger and tomatoes and onion and garlic, sweet potatoes, peanut butter. And it's the stew that is just, it's kind of sweet and spicy and tart. It has all of these things in it together. And a few of my relatives even asked me for the recipe because they went back for seconds and I, they thought, oh, this is really you know, what's in it? What are, they couldn't, it was so unique. They couldn't even figure out what the flavors were. So that, that was one of, those are two of my favorite items to bring. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. to bring pineapple chili with cornbread. That always goes mm -hmm. over really well. And then uh, for the people that are more standard American diet, I like to make sloppy joes because they love the sloppy joes and they don't know they're meatless. <laughs> lasagna is always the big hit too chef aj's chef aj's lasagna is very good a, a crowd pleaser also there's a butter bean potato soup which everyone loves that's on monkey and me kitchen adventures in case you're interested in looking that one up but that is super there's so many recipes that you could bring to a, a potluck yeah, in those fact, are we have a great idea. Potluck. Oh, and, I'm and, sorry. 
in my research, I actually found a um, quite a few collections of Thanksgiving comfort foods uh, from Forks Over Knives, McDougal, all the you know websites that we're on a lot have um, a, a collection for this time of year. So I've included the link, and that'll be posted. Uh, so available shortly after our presentation, as soon as it's all downloaded. And then um, if you just search in um, when you're thinking about, you know, making a new recipe, search in like macaroni and cheese, mac and cheese, plant-based, vegan, oil-free. You will get pumpkin recipes that have mac and cheese, butternut squash in the sauce, unique things that people would never imagine are in mac and cheese so whatever it is just google it and you'll find all you know exciting new recipes to try that's what i do Hi. Right, so um any other questions and i don't see any in the chat um i do have one other one so how can we um, either for Janet or for Sid, um, how can we handle a party maybe that's like family style where you're not really responsible for bringing other, bringing your own food um, and the food there maybe isn't, isn't the best selection for, for us um, trying to follow a whole food plant-based way of eating um, and you end up having to, to pay for the meal and it's at like say it's catered. Um, what what would how would you how would you guys navigate that situation? It's actually a situation that I'm I'm hoping Sid could come up with a uh, <laughs> because so if, every I have to deal with this every year. <laughs> oh, if you are going to a place where it's a catered dinner, right? and you know the restaurant, I would highly recommend you call the chef ahead of time and tell them that you're following a special diet for health reasons and could they please make you a plate? And 99% of the time they will, especially if you tell them, give them ideas. Like, you know, if I could have a pasta with maybe some roasted veggies, uh, asparagus on top and a marinara, you know, be specific with them about what you can and cannot have. And you'll be surprised at what they will actually come up with for you, come up with for you many times. If you want to eat something before you go to the restaurant, that might be a good option too. Or even if they can just give you a big salad and throw some beans on it and you bring your own dressing in your purse, you know, and eat a little bowl of soup or something before you go to the restaurant. There are ways to, to do it. I've got a couple videos on my YouTube channel about how to eat out and then how to survive family parties and things, if that would be of help. Thanks. I like that for health reasons. <laughs> it's true. It, you're right. Yeah. So, And one of the things um, that I forgot to add in, into my little talk is all the nutrition. When you look at a label on a produce, it just really says, has a number on it. It doesn't have all the antioxidants and the nutrition that it contains. If it did, I think more people would choose those fruits and vegetables because pumpkin not only has beta carotene, um, A, it has protein, it has fiber, it has vitamin K, uh, vitamin C, it has B6, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium. I mean, it has a list of you know, nutrients, plus all the antioxidants and the phytochemicals that are all what our body needs to feel good and to feed our cells. But if all of that, just imagine if all of that list of what is in there was on that fruit and vegetable, we would all switch and we would want them. But we have to Google that and take, take time to uh, Google it, research it, and if you knew all of that ahead of time, I think it would be, it's more encouraging that I'm feeding my body what, what it needs instead of the pumpkin Oreo cookies that are on the shelf that are calling your name in the store. And, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to resist those things because they are good at marketing, aren't they? 
Yes, I, they are. <laughs> I was just in Aldi a few days ago in the specialty aisle and in subtle, I didn't buy anything, but I was there looking for ideas on what they would use, what they were using that had pumpkin in it. There was pumpkin coffee, pumpkin creamer, pumpkin butter, pumpkin tomato sauce, pumpkin cookies, pumpkin ale, pumpkin cider there. I mean, everything was pumpkin. So instead of buying any, any of it, I was, I took pictures of the front and the back of the ingredients. And I thought I'm going to figure out, you know, when I get home, which ones sound good to me that I'd like to try in my own kitchen. So I Googled and found tons of recipes for all the things that they had on the shelf. So that's another good idea that I use to, um, to kind of keep me not putting it in my cart because once it ends in the cart it's in your house and guess what <laughs> we can't avoid it right right yeah the decision to eat healthy starts at the store right. many times yeah and and some people today I know Carrie said she doesn't really go to the store much she orders online so it's a little easier less temptation when you're ordering online and just getting everything delivered or you pick up um, at the store. So that may be an idea for people that are tempted because as soon as you walk into the store, you're bombarded with the Halloween candy and all the sweets and the bakery and everything. So a strategy to avoid that would be to order just what you want online or just go to the produce section and then leave. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like ordering some stuff online. I will say they don't have uh, the largest selection, um, but a lot of the staples I'm able to find and get regularly week to week. Um, and it does help because not only is it less temptation when you're at the store, but it fits into a busy schedule and you don't necessarily have to go shopping every week. Um, sometimes I don't go um, more than every three weeks. So you're able to kind of do it on your own schedule and have something delivered to you that you know is going to be healthy and it avoids the temptation of buying all of the other things that you encounter in the store. Absolutely. That's a great strategy. And Carrie, you wrote a, a wonderful article with all the nutrition and it's on our monthly newsletter as far as what contains pumpkin. So if anyone is not getting our newsletter or we haven't read it, Carrie uh, cited all of her references to what was it basically about pumpkin? Yeah. So this latest one was pumpkin spice and basically all of the different spices that are in the mixture. Um, I thought it would be interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of people hear about pumpkin spice this and pumpkin spice that around this time of year and it's everywhere, but we don't take time to realize the nutritional benefits that are in all of the different components and why it's so important to um, to use all of the spices, whether they're together in a mix or separately, um, and finding ways to incorporate them into healthy dishes that you can make at home. So decided to write an article on that. Yeah, it was an excellent. I encourage everyone to sign up for our newsletter, pbnm.org. It's uh, free to be a member. And uh, the recording of this with um, with all of the uh, the links that I researched for recipes such as puddings and uh, savory soups. I have recipes from Italy, from Mexico, from Africa, Ethiopia, uh, Southern comfort foods, and then uh, tips on not uh, entertaining for people in your home, and then also going to various parties and simple simple ideas that we grew up with, the recipes on a typical Thanksgiving or um, holiday table and how we can make them healthier with a plant-based oil-free uh, recipe. All right, well, I don't see any questions in the chat, um, but I would like to you know, honor everyone's time and we'll take a little bit of time to, to wrap things up a little. Um, thank you everyone for being here live or for those who are gonna watch the recording later. Um, we invite you to use the show notes that we've mentioned. Uh, we'll have all of the links that Janet is referencing um, for you to check out. 
we encourage you to try something new, to experience a new flavor, a new spice blend, a new recipe, or an ingredient that you haven't tried before. Uh, feel free to let us know in the YouTube comments what you tried and how it went. Before we say goodbye, let me tell you about next month's event. It will be um, the fourth week in November, and we are going to have Marguerite Ruminski speak uh, for us. And she is the owner of Healthy Sins Catering and the Vegan Cafe in downtown Lockport, Illinois. The Vegan Cafe is raw, vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO, organic, refined sugar-free and hydrogenated oil-free and 100% delicious. It's the only restaurant in this category outside of Chicago. Uh, Marguerite will be sharing her own remarkable healing story, starting with a 1997 multiple sclerosis diagnosis to a food as medicine holistic lifestyle. And she is a creative recipe developer as well as a raw vegan culinary instructor. She is proud of her Greek heritage and will be sharing a family favorite weekday recipe that's been handed down for generations. It's a rice and spinach one pot easy side dish, fancy enough for your holiday table. Um, the date once again for November's event is Tuesday the 28th, the week following Thanksgiving. We hope to see everyone back and invite a friend maybe. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night.